So motivational interviewing was originated by Bill Miller. And it, he first started getting curious about this um, when he was doing a, a treatment of behavioral uh, approaches for alcohol treatment. And what he noticed, what he noticed in the data is he was like, well, I wonder if we just coded how empathetic the therapists were um, and see if that does anything. And in fact, the empathy effect swamped all of the other effects uh, of the treatment. In fact, it explained up to two thirds of the variability in drinking at follow-up. In other words, the more empathetic the, the therapist was rated as, um, the less drinking their clients were doing. And he first developed this intervention called the Drinker's Checkup, which turned into motivational enhancement therapy, which is what a lot of people might be familiar with, which is essentially a structured form of MI that includes feedback. And then it sort of developed into this set of, uh, this sort of way of being, actually. I was going to call it a set of techniques, but it's not a technique called motivational interviewing. Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with MET, if you've heard of motivational enhancement therapy, it's essentially motivational interviewing that's uh, semi-structured and has feedback. Um, so you might say, somebody might fill out a survey about their drinking, and you'd say, okay, look, you're drinking at this you know, 78 percentile. What do you think about that? Um, defining motivational interviewing is easy. You can do it for you right here. So it's a person-centered guiding method of communication to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. That's what it is, one sentence. We've been, the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers has been debating and going back and forth as Bill and Steve Rolnick work on MI3, the third edition of the book. And this is what it was like a year and a half ago. It's still evolving. But one sentence, right? A person-centered guiding method of communication to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. Um, it's easy to define, but actually enacting it um, and really understanding the definition takes quite a bit of subtlety. And I want to um, show you a quick video, a quick segment of a video um, of motivational interviewing with a horse. <laughs> it, it's not, so it's not quite, I actually don't know if we, do we have sound on this? Or not? Looks like we might not, but actually you don't even need um, sound for this. I don't know if we do or not, but we'll. So this is Monty Roberts. He's um, the horse whisperer, is what uh, he's nicknamed. I'm pushing away. Oh, there you go. There's licking and chewing. So uh, this is about two minutes or three minutes in. This is a horse that has never had a saddle. And uh, Monty Roberts is uh, sort of famous for his ability to get horses to wear a saddle and have a rider in a very short period of time without any sort of punitive or uh, punishing uh, approaches, which is you know, sort of the, the reverse or opposite of a lot of ways that horses first get saddled. Um, so he's been uh, essentially having this horse sort of walk around uh, this thing, it's, it's about two minutes in. Very nice. Very nice. So, we predicted the ear, we predicted the head and the eye coming over, coming closer. <coughs> we made our prediction on the licking and chewing, and there's the bowing down. There's the bowing down. Very nice. Super good girl. That's so demonstrative right there. That's just as you see the Mustang do it. There's the licking and chewing again. Quite Is that good. the horse doing licking and chewing? <laughs> Very good conversation. Next round, I will go passive. Good licking and chewing. I will go passive the next round. Take my left shoulder by and then drop my eyes away from her eyes and reverse the whole procedure. There we go. I'll get myself on a 45. 45 now. And invite her in. Very nice. Super good girl. There is the moment of growing up. You are good girl. Well, tell her how nice she is for coming in here. Invite her into my chest, standing right in front. Don't look her in the eye. I've already done that, and that means go away. Now I want her to be here with me, and she's finding value. And that's going up, and now I'll walk away and attempt to get follow-up. Wonderful. <coughs> Good follow up. I'll come around here now and try to make a left turn and have a come with 
Right, so now it's just messing. <laughs> so that, you know, Monty Roberts, uh, Bill Miller was introduced to Monty Roberts, and as they were talking, and Bill learned about this technique for uh, saddling horses and uh, um, getting them ready to take riders, uh, he was struck by the parallel to motivational interview. You can see with entirely with no physical contact, with only his presence, um, with uh, not pushing at the horse, um, but rather guiding the horse. You notice even when he's walking with the horse, the horse's nose is right here, right? He's not leading it, he's not pulling it along. He's not at the horse's other end, pushing it along. Um, he's just guiding. And this is one sense of what the spirit of motivational interviewing is all about. It's about joining, it's about guiding, um, it's about evoking some desire from within the client, within the individual. Um, we'll get back to that. So the first uh, thing you should know is this is the evidence-based practice lecture series. Uh, motivational interviewing works. And it works for a really broad range of changeable behaviors. One way to think about it is almost anything that an individual could actively choose to change about their lives. So if they have to have some control, some ability to change, um, <clears throat> they can change it. It started with addictions, but it spread over into uh, well, a broad, uh, it started with alcoholism, it spread into a broad array of uh, substance use uh, problems. Um, it's spread into healthcare settings for a broad range of changeable uh, behaviors. And here's just a, a short list of things that it's commonly used for. Um, uh, there's over 200 uh, randomized clinical, uh, there's the 200 clinical trials, um, and some high proportion of those are RCTs, good randomized control trials. Um, you can see all of these things are things that, to some degree, the patient has some responsibility for changing. Now, this is, I want to take Alan Marlat's point, and this is not to say that they have responsibility for getting to the point where they are uh, in the same way that they have responsibility for changing from where they are. Um, so uh, one thing that, to point out, too, is that a lot of these, in fact, almost all of them, are things that might be relevant to children and adolescents. Um, you can have... Uh, for example, diabetes management for adolescents with uh, diabetes, dietary change, um, juvenile hypertension, obviously substance use, child mental health. We could also add in parenting. Motivational interviewing has been used to help engage people uh, in parenting programs and help keep them engaged uh, in parenting programs. So MI works, and it's worked for, and I, this sort of sounds a little sketchy when you say it, but it's worked for almost everything that people have looked at it, uh, in part because when people look at it, they look for um, they, they look at behaviors that people can make some sort of conscious choice um, to make a change for. It's been extensively studied in adolescence. This is just a short list of studies. Um, it's not coming out well, but I just made this one big because it's number 77 on the list. And this is a list that I got off of the server about two years ago. Um, I haven't seen it updated. So there is a pile of studies that have sh demonstrated effectiveness across a broad range of behaviors in adolescence. Um, uh, there's less about MI with children in part because interacting with the children with cognitive resources uh, are different and so probably the best application of motivational interviewing uh, with children would probably be using MI with their parents. Um, you know, you can use some of the skills of motivational interviewing uh, with kids, but it's going to be, you know, somewhat less. Um, it's, the interaction is going to be somewhat different because they have different uh, freedoms and abilities um, and cognitive resources. What, not only does MI work, but it works in what I think are some unexpected situations. Um, so the first one is, uh, MI works better with people who are ethnic minorities. A lot of times we think our treatments that we develop, you know, we develop them on these, you know, sort of white upper middle class, often, you know, college students or sort of the white upper middle class community. We don't know how it's gonna work with people of different ethnicities, different socioeconomic status. Consistently, the meta-analyses suggest that motivational interviewing works better um, uh, with ethnic minor with minorities than it does with majorities. Um, interestingly, if you don't manualize the treatment, so if you, I, I couldn't quite find MI for dummies, but I thought that was close enough. Um, <laughs> if you don't manualize the treatment, uh, the effect of MI doubles. You don't have a manual. Now this is not saying non-adherent MI. The people who are doing MI without a manual are doing adherent MI, so that they're, they're, you can code their behaviors, they're doing everything you're supposed to do MI, but they're not following a manual. Doubles the effect. And, uh, and I'll talk a lot about change language or change talk, um, uh, uh, what, it, it's more effective when uh, the client is talking a lot more about changing towards the end of the session than they are, than whenever they are at the beginning. So it's like, well, how much, you know, so they come in telling you all they're ready to change, 
Um, <clears throat> it's not as good of a predictor, but when uh, clients walk out talking about wanting to change, um, that's when uh, it seems to be especially effective, and that's one indicator that it's going to be effective. So it works in some, I think, relatively unexpected situations. Also, what, what I think is really amazing about MI, um, because if you, I haven't given you that sense of the brief intervention. So you can do it in one session, two sessions, two sessions might even be pushing it. Um, you can do it in healthcare settings in as little as five minutes. Um, you can do it in 15, 20 minute sessions um, uh, of MI, and it works. It can work as a very brief intervention. And it, what's cool is that it works for a very long period of time. So here we see effect size is about 0.4, one to three months following a brief intervention, a couple of sessions usually for these studies, um, with the effect size declining. And I know you can't see this super well, um, but th there's a line here, this line C2, where the effect size 0.6 is pretty big, is maintained. Well, what is that? What's interesting is that when you combine motivational interview with other evidence-based treatments, the effect gets bigger and stays. It gets maintained. So what a lot of folks have done is to add motivational interviewing as an adjunct at, at sort of the beginning of therapy to increase engagement in their patients, which will increase the effect size and increase <coughs> and, uh, maintain retention uh, over time. And this is from a 2005 meta-analysis of, um, I think, 77 RCTs. Okay, so MI works. I hope I've convinced you of that. It works for a lot of people. It works for a lot of behaviors, and it works better in certain circumstances. Often those are unexpected. Um, how does it work? I think the essence of MI is based in um, some of Daryl Ben's theory. is the idea that we are best convinced by our own reasons for changing or for doing anything. Um, in other words, we think motivational interviewing works because <clears throat> as a result of the MI session, people start talking themselves into changing. And, and the, the really the goal of the MI practitioner is to try to elicit that change talk from within the person. That's why we think it works. We have evidence that increased change talk in a session is related to client outcomes. We also have evidence that motivational interviewing uh, skill is related to um, client change talk. We don't quite have the data to put it all together yet, but folks are working on that. So this is, because I do like statistics um, in my other life, this is a um, uh, sort of statistical life model. Um, so again, we think that MI works because it increases change talk, which in turn increases the client's inherent uh, commitment to changing. So you can have a lot of change talk, but if it doesn't turn into commitment, it's much less likely that uh, change is actually going to happen. So we think it works because first, therapists get trained in MI, they develop uh, higher levels of empathy and MI spirit. They also use lots of MI consistent methods, a lot of these sort of micro skills that I'll talk about in a minute. When they go into sessions with clients, they, they deploy those skills uh, in the spirit of um, MI spirit and empathy. You get a lot more client preparatory change talk and commitment language that in turn uh, increases the client's commitment to behavior change um, and results in behavior change. 